Gauravani Pacharine Nevise Sasandivari Pachati Vishtani Om Namo Bhagavate Vashadevaya 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 Streaming on my timeline. It wouldn't let me stream on my page. Not there. Well, your time. Oh wait, wait, wait. How about now? This is it's on your. It doesn't pop up. Maybe your profile picture. Maybe it's on your timeline. Wouldn't let me do it on my page. Oh, my time. Okay. Whatever. You can send out a message, it's on Zoom. Also. Oh. Krishna, go I think I have to get off the sign. The sign. <laughs> so we are reading from the seventh canto, second chapter. To about the fourth verse or something, I have to check. Anybody remember what verse? Seven, two, try five. Uh, seven, two, nine. Seven, two, nine. Ah, one of those days. He ended with him saying he was going to cut off Lord Vishnu's head. And these, his brother here, are actually the profuse blood from his body. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we forgive Oh, yeah, him. the blood suckers, remember? A few blood suckers. That's our new line for me to, to convince them. So, um, yeah. So Hiranyakashipu said he was going to take revenge and suck the blood of Vishnu. Is that it? Vishnu doesn't have blood. It's going to be hard. Well, right, we get purified, I guess. So that was, um, yeah, I think we're on text 10. Destroying Brahmin. Doesn't demons always try to destroy Brahminical culture? They like figured it out, you know. To destroy the brains, then we can just control everybody. No one will so stop us. He can be demigods. Yeah. Basic system yeah, right, right. Both, yeah. So this is text 10. Tabadyatta bhuvangyu yang brahmachatra samedikam sudhayad bham tapo yagya shudhyaya vratadhaninaha. While I am engaged in the business of killing Lord Vishnu, go down to the planet Earth, which is flourishing due to a Brahminical culture and a Kshatriya government. These people engage in austerity, sacrifice Vedic study, regulative vows and charity, destroy all the people thus engaged. Hare. Purport. Hiranyakashipu's main purpose was to disturb the demigods. He planned first to kill Lord Vishnu so that with Lord Vishnu's death, 
the demigods would automatically weaken and die. Another of his plans was to disturb the residents of planet Earth. The peace and prosperity of the residents of Earth and all the other planets were maintained by the Brahmanas and Kshatriyas. The Lord says in Bhagavad Gita 4.13, Chatur Banyam, Maya Shishtam Guna Karma Vibhagasha. According to the three modes of material nature and the work ascribed to them, the four divisions of human society were created by me. On all the planets, there are different types of residents. But the Lord recommends, referring especially to the planet Earth, which is inhabited by human beings, that society be divided into four varnas, Brahmana, Kshatriya, Vaishya, and Shudra. Before the advent of Lord Krishna on this earth, it is understood that the earth was managed by the Brahmins and Kshatriyas. The duty of the Brahmins is to cultivate Shamaha, peacefulness, Damaha, self-control, Itiksha, tolerance, Satyam, truthfulness, Socham, cleanliness, and Arjavam, simplicity. That's just the beginning of the list. So that's all Prabhupada listed. And then to advise the Chaitanya kings how to rule the, con the country or planet. Following the instructions of the Brahmanas, the Chaitanya should engage the populace in austerity, sacrifices, Vedic study, and adherence to the rules and regulations established by Vedic principles. So I was smiling when I read this word austerity, because I was thinking, you imagine engaging Americans in austerity? There'd be massive revolution, right? I mean, we try to force us to, you have to do austerity if you have to do austerity. You try to force it on them. They don't like austerity. They should also arrange for charity to be given to the Brahmins and Sri Following the instructions of the Brahmins, the Chatriyas should engage the populace in austerity, sacrifices, Vedic study, and adherence to the rules and regulations established by Vedic principles. They should also arrange for charity to be given to the Brahmins and sannyasis and temples. This is the godly arrangement of Brahminical culture. People are inclined to offer yagya because unless sacrifices are offered, there will be insufficient rain. Yagya bhavati parjanya, Bhagavad Gita 3.14, which will hamper agricultural activities, parjanya on the sambhavaha. By introducing Brahminical culture, therefore, a chatriya government should engage people in performing yagya studying the Vedas and giving charity. Thus the people will receive their necessities for life very easily. And there will be no disturbances in society. But what did Prabhupada just say? If we do yagya, then the earth will give everything. But the demigods will give, the earth will give. And then he says, studying the Vedas and giving charity, because um, if we do the yagyas and Prabhupada says, then we'll have all our necessities, unless we're educated to know what our necessities, necessities are, we'll never have enough necessities. So that it has to go together. People will receive their necessities very easily, and there will be no disturbance in society. So it seems that Prabhupada's equating working like an ass to, to live with disturbances in society. I'll read it, see if you agree. Thus people, 
will receive their necessities from the saints. Do yagya, study the Vedas, give charity. Thus people will receive their necessities for life very easily and there will be no disturbances in society. So what are the disturbances that Prabhupada is referring to? Who can say? So why, if we get our necessities very easily, these things go away? Yeah, that's one reason, yeah. And also people will be satisfied, they'll be self-satisfied. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. That's what I was thinking. There is um there's one teacher who said that if you become spiritually happy, it's a contribution to society. Because at least in my experience, people who are experiencing more Krishna consciousness, who are more self-satisfied, they're easier to get along with. They're less critical, they're less envious. They're more peaceful. And their association, by their association, you feel that way also. So happy, peaceful, less inclined. Like um, someone like Jayananda, it was actually we would say almost impossible in his presence to criticize somebody. It's like it couldn't come out of you. It was, his association was so, so um, transcendental and powerful and pure. So when people are like that, you know, Prabhupada we said perfect gentlemen. So you elevate and then why do disturbances go away? Because people aren't in passion and ignorance. So in goodness, all the disturbances are passion and ignorance. So our society cultivates passion and ignorance. It, it puts it on a pedestal, it makes movies about it, right? Violence and sex, they really are very related and those, that's what sells and that's what people see. What is, okay. anyone else want to say something about that? I just think it's pretty amazing here that you know, like people think that in order to get the necessities of life, you have to work very hard. You know? But what Prabhupada's saying is that all you need to do is perform yagya, which in this age is sankirtan. Yeah. So basically, you need to chant Hare Krishna, study the scriptures, and then give charity. And that's how you get everything you need. Sounds good to me. <laughs> what an easy life. So everyone can quit their jobs today. <laughs> um, you know, I was making that point that when Prabhupada says the necessities, um, his definition of necessities and modern society's definition are different. Because many times Prabhupada said, so you have some land, you grow your food, then you grow cotton, make your clothes, so you're, like then he would say, your problems are solved. Like you have, you know, and then whatever, the local trees or mud or whatever, you make your home. So your shelter and your food problem is solved. So now you sit down and chant Hare Krishna. Sounds simple, right? Let's go do it. Um, yeah, so when Prabhupada says necessities, sometimes he says bare necessities. Mm -hmm. so, um, so the problem is that the way the economy is set up, we have to train people, we have to incite people to live beyond necessity. Otherwise, the economy will crash. And everyone is being programmed consciously, subconsciously. And to think that um, there was one, there's one little video, that I'm one more Rolex away from bliss. It was kind of the programming. One more, and he had three Rolexes on his, so I'm one more away. I think he had four Rolexes. I'm one more away from this. So that programming has to be there. That's the problem. That's why I was saying it's, whenever we've seen any austerity imposed upon Americans, 
they don't take it well. Europeans take it better. You imagine the austerities Ukrainians are going through. And if you've ever watched the interviews with Ukrainians, they're not even complaining. They're just describing what's happening and they're not making comments generally. This is unfair. This is so bad. Look at us. The world needs to help us. They're just saying, this is what happened. And, you know, I would think if that was America, it would be a bit different. Just a little bit different. Yeah. So we sometimes wonder when Prabhupada's saying, this is how society would live if we tried to implement that. How would we be able to do that in a way that people would see it as positive? And so some devotees posit the idea, well, if there's major disaster in the world, they don't have a choice. Then if things are so bad that the simple living that we're talking about is a step up. But it may not be possible for people to come to that realization without some, something catastrophic happening. And it seems that was in the plan because Prabhupada predicted these things. You know, one time in Atlanta, Prabhupada was on a walk and they could see the skyline. And he said, very soon, everyone will leave. It will get so bad, they'll leave. And the devotee saying, well, when will that happen? Prabhupada said, in your lifetime. That was his prediction. We don't know exactly, but Prabhupada would make predictions like that, that it's going to get to that point. So when we read purports like this, um, like study of the Vedas, we're not talking about Vaishnava books. We're talking about it's, this is not Krishna consciousness. This is uh, Dharma, Artha, Kama, Moksha stuff. You know, even the Brahmanas, and that's why necessarily that Brahmana Vaishnava is performing yoga. Yeah. So it's interesting how Prabhupada will sometimes um, take it, you know, transform the Vedic to the Vaishnava, yeah. you know. And, and I was also thinking because that connects a little bit with his statement in the introduction to nectar devotion, which says nectar devotion is not to condemn any materialistic life, it's mm -hmm. simply to teach us how to love Krishna. Mm -hmm. yeah. he, says, yeah. he says, have your material comforts. And love Krishna. <laughs> so yeah. sometimes he talks on a societal level, and sometimes he just says, yeah. whatever. But the, well, the point is interesting because, as you said, Prabhupada's talking here about, well, the Vedas, he's also talking about yagya, and he didn't say Sankirtan yagya, he said yagyas, studying the Vedas, giving charity. And then, you know, obviously elsewhere, the yagya is yeah, Hare, Hare Krishna. Uh, the same. Then he connects it. Yeah. Yagya for this age. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, he's mentioning that because that's what's here in the verse, is talk about yagya, so that's that. Yeah, it's, you know, worship demigods type thing. Yeah. Yeah. Please the demigods, you'll get what you need. But it's interesting how, like, it's just, it always strikes me that it's so opposite from modern, you know, the mindset of most people because, mm -hmm. like, what you said, with artha and economic development comes from dharma. It doesn't come from karma. <laughs> it yeah. doesn't come from yeah. work. Yeah. 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 Because life, even if you want material things. Well, you see that in India. People understand that. You, if you praise somebody, I don't know about now in India, but when we lived there in the late 90s, if you praise somebody, they would just go, Bhagavan. It's immediately just go Bhagavan. They understood, you know? And every day in their business, they do their puja because <laughs> Lakshmi or Bhagavan. Which was a cash register. And they had always make sure they would, you know, come to temples and give donations. They understood that principle. That, that, you can't become rich without charity. But ma modern materialists also understand. They can't explain it, but they understand it. I read a book by one of the most, I don't, I don't there's some pretty, there's some pretty indecent people out there in the public eye. And the guy who wrote this book was one of them and it was all about money, how to make money, how much he makes and how he does it. And 
but he has a chapter in there about if you want to get rich, you have to give charity. And he said, I don't know why this works. All I know is it works. Because <laughs> yeah, if it didn't work, I wouldn't give charity. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the so the concept is demigods are pleased and they provide. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, you see it in ISKCON. There's no skinny, starving devotees in ISKCON. And Prabhupada used to say, when when we um, all lived in the temple. He said, we are not working and the neighbors are envious. How are they getting so much? And then and so Prabhupada said, invite them to move in with us. <laughs> but that they will not do. So. Mm. Yeah. But then one can make the argument, well, you know, there's a lot of wealthy people not worshiping the demigods. The last life. Oh, Running on fumes. <laughs> and there are other reasons you can become wealthy. You give wealth, yeah, no charity. That's the spring. Yeah. Anyway, so Prabhupada's quoting the, the Gita verse of worshiping the demigods. Ishtan bhogan ibo deva prashante yabya bhavitaha tardatan apradhaya yaibhyo. In charge of the various necessities of life, the demigods, being satisfied by the performance of yajna, supply all necessities to man. But he who enjoys these gifts without, without offering them to the demigods in return is certainly a thief. The famous story of the man who made glass. And Prabhupada said, Where, How do you make glass? From sand, where does he get the sand? From the beach. Who created the sand? God. So you're stealing from God. That was the problem. I took him down the logical conclusion. But then one of the devotees said, but Prabhupada, he gives donations to the temple. And Prabhupada laughed and said, then he is just a little thief, not a big thief. And another man came and met Prabhupada. Mr. Seti, the one who eventually built the temple, but he met Prabhupada and <laughs> classic Prabhupada. So he meets him the first time and said, what time do you get up, Mr. Seti? I get up at seven or whatever, six. I said, what do you do? He said, I have my coffee and read the newspaper and then I go to work for my, not coffee, tea, go to work. And then I come home like you know, seven, eight at night, when I have my meal, then I go to sleep. And then Prabhupada said, what is the difference between you and a pig? Oh. And he took it. So there you go, ladies and gentlemen. Excuse me, sir, I have a question for you. What is the difference between you and a pig? The demigods, uh, yeah. the demigods are authorized the supplying agents who act on behalf of the Supreme Personality of God additionally. Therefore, they must be satisfied by the performance of prescribed yajnas. In the Vedas, there are different kinds of yajnas prescribed for different kinds of demigods, but all are ultimately offered to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. For one who cannot understand what the personality of Godhead is, sacrifice to the demigods is recommended. Hmm. According to the different material qualities of the person's concern, different types of yajnas are recommended in the Vedas. Worship of different demigods is also on the same basis, namely according to different qualities. Just so interesting, you know, we were talking yesterday about meeting people where they're at, and not forcing them to artificially come to a higher standard is basically what, what's being done. Vedas for people, Puranas for people, and mode of ignorance for passion, for goodness, you know, and with different siddhantas accordingly. You know. Interesting, isn't it?
it's different than Judeo Christian with either you're with it or yeah. at, yeah. in or out. Well, I was just thinking that there is there are devotees who interpret Shastra that way. Yeah. You know, it's like you either do it or you don't. And there's that's it. Which is okay if you're talking about ashram life, if you're living in an ashram, then yeah, there's standards. At least these are the minimal standards. There's not there's no wiggle room. But for the general public, there's all kinds of wiggle room. And um, if if you were to analyze Prabhupada's strategy, his in in his personal dealings with people, what would be what would, in your mind, would be prominent? What that Prabhupada was doing or characteristic in his dealing with people? What would you always relate to them. Meaning? Relate? Like whatever they're interested in, you would start off talking yeah. about that and try to use that as a starting point and then gradually to the next information. Relatable, yeah. And then? So once he found out what they were doing, then what? What would he do with it? Yeah. He would find a way to engage it, and then he would encourage that engagement. And one of the ways Prabhupada encouraged we know because you can go and look at his letters he would tell the devotee who was working at gurukul this is the most important service he would tell book distributors this is the most important service he would tell college preachers this is the most important bi this is the most important so then each devotee would feel my service is most important so because if you don't feel your service is important it's hard to be inspired like, what am I doing? Wasting time. I should be doing something else. So, from, from my perspective, I, I don't have a quote. Maybe someone knows, but the basic idea is do you know that story? Somebody was, I don't know, criticizing, or somebody was doing something, and all the devotees were complaining. And Prabhupada said, my service is to encourage and your service is to discourage. <laughs> you heard that story? Some, you know, one of the leaders was like, might have been with Tamakrishna Maharaj and Radha Dhammada, you know, creating a problem. My service is to encourage your sim simply discourage. But so sometimes we saw that because we would be too heavy with people, they would become discouraged. Right? And Prabhupada's, you know, he's just, his whole thing is, Maya is trying to encourage us. His spiritual life is difficult. Maya will discourage us from spiritual life. So the spiritual master, his one of his reasons for existence is to encourage, to inspire. So, um, one of my godbrothers told me a story of Prabhupada's inspiration. He, it was probably 1976 in Los Angeles. So in 1976, Los Angeles was kind of the high point because BBT was there, the devotees were building fake museums was there, the Golden Avatar Studios was there, Bhaktivedanta Book Trust was right there about a mile from the temple, Spiritual Sky Incense was there. Of course, with many Dwarkadish, the Sankirtan party. So what Prabhupada did was he took a tour of every department. And so this godbrother said, yeah, he went to the art department. He went where they lay out the books, the warehouse, spiritual sky, golden avatar. Maybe another department. But he, he said, wherever Prabhupada went, he would say, whatever they were doing in that, he would just go up and, you know, print books for Krishna. Then you go to the art department, do art for Krishna. Then you go to the recording department. The recording studio, sing for Krishna, go to book warehouse, distribute books for Krishna, just go down encouraging everybody. 
except spiritual scienza, no encouragement. <laughs> That's just a side point, which I'll get to in a minute. Hold you in suspense for a minute. Um, but the point was, Prabhupada would often say, somehow be engaged in Krishna's service because it's for your benefit, because he doesn't need it. You know, so somehow be engaged. Um, and that famous letter to Karandar, draw out, and draw out enthusiasm through challenge, find, which basically means find what the devotees like, challenge them what's good, better, bigger. Encourage. So this is how Prabhupada encouraged. So when uh, one of the people at Spiritual Sky said, Srila Prabhupada, everywhere you went, you encouraged them except with us. Why didn't you encourage us? Prabhupada said, you're all Vaishyas, you don't need encouragement. You're naturally <laughs> enthusiastic to make money. You need encouragement and sadhana. Yes. So he didn't encourage them. Make money. So they're already, you're already encouraged to make money. So I don't have to encourage you. So, yeah. so, so we can see that was Prabhupada's business. Like you said, and Prabhupada himself said, my strategy my preaching strategies, find the spark and fan it. That was it. So and Prabhupada was asked, why are you traveling so much at this old age? You know, three days here, three days here, five days here, four days here. And basically his answer was keep my disciples encouraged, enthusiastic. Hmm. Pleasure to be here. What time do we stop? Usually 8.30. So we haven't finished the purport, but does anyone want to say anything or ask a question? I heard a good analogy yesterday about uh, demigod worship. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if it's perfect, but it was interesting that it's like in a well-to-do house, if the uh, children just glorify and thank the butler or the maid all the time. Oh, you made such a great meal. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. You're getting the, the parents are paying the butler. You know, without the parents, the butler would be on the street. That's kind of like the demigod worship. Yeah. But here, but here Prabhupada makes an interesting point. I don't know if you picked up on it. For one who cannot understand what the personality of God is, Godhead is sacrifice to the demigods is recommended. Yeah, like, um, well, the whole concept is there's somebody higher than you. So, Prabhupada generally indicates worship someone higher than like Gop Kumar, maybe you'll keep going up, you know, who's above you, who's above you, and you come to God. So, if you can't get there, that's another way to get there. I guess it's hard for us to understand because we don't. In America, we just have God. Yeah, you have angels, but no one's doing puja to angels generally. Maybe in South America, I don't know. My question Mother is, Mary. in both cases, God or demigods, you can't see them. Right. You know, you don't have experience. You don't have proof of So if you can accept that demigods exist, why can't you accept them? I don't know if I can answer it well. We would probably need an Indian, unless you have an answer. You're like, because within that culture, maybe demigods are more prominent and they're more they're um, more part of the daily life. You know, like the gopis would go to Katayani to get a good husband. It was maybe in tradition, it was just like, that was just like normal part of their daily tradition. That's what I would guess. Well, the other part is that they don't make the distinction. Because, you know, you know that story, who was that story? I heard that from probably, you know, it was that one of those typical um, yeah, but, altars yeah, but, that has like, you know, everybody. And uh, the devotee just saw Prabhupada picking some flowers and putting it in a corner someplace. And then Prabhupada left and he saw there was a little picture of Krishna mm -hmm. amongst, you know, yeah. with demigods. So, yeah. But often they don't make much of a distinction. Yeah. We yeah. wouldn't either unless we felt we didn't have yeah. any, that was great. We didn't have any knowledge. Yeah. So we just, yeah. You know, sometimes when Prabhupada makes a point, there's a backstory, but he doesn't tell it. And th this is like, what's the backstory to this point? There's got to be something where, you know, historically, that's ha what happened. This group of people worship demigods, and then it's kind of like Shankaracharya comes, okay, get the Vedas back in, and then we'll talk later. 
about Krishna. He says the same thing about the universal form, but at least that makes sense because it's material things. Yeah. You really can't conceive yeah. of the Supreme Personality of God. The only thing they can see is material world, but you know, Krishna's universe. Yeah. <laughs> That would that was the only thing I could think of is what I said that was probably so ingrained in the culture, yeah. like you know because you see that you know Indians in the rain dance and the Greek mythology you know there's all the go gods here like seem because they're the gods are needed for their maintenance so there's the general and they they'll do the god dance and then it rains they're like oh, okay here's the god of rain we see it happening. Yeah. Must be something like that. Or we did this puja and then we got a good harvest. All these festivals, you know, harvest festivals, but many harvest festivals were worshiping a god who would provide the harvest, right? Then when it comes to America, we got rid of all the gods, so there's only one left. So it's either him or nobody. So, we have, so it may not be a lot of the demigods, you know, like recently when I started um, when I was giving initiation, I stopped reading all the 10 offenses because there's only like three that are really, that really three or four that really are relevant. The so ones with demigods, we have no. Unless you're initiating any devotees in India. Yeah, right, unless you're initiating devotees in India. But for us in the West, it's not a problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Prabhu's done, yeah, don't do karma kanda. I never did it. Yeah, or like you said, I don't even know what it is. Um, I mean, you could expand upon it and relate it in some way, but it's not the intention. Of, it wasn't exactly the intention of that. You can always do that. And sometimes we have to do it because it's so not, it's so coming from another culture that we haven't been exposed to. And so kind of, what does that mean for us? It could mean this and that. But really didn't mean that initially. It was not what it meant. So anyway, we don't have to worry about it. One less thing to worry about. Yeah. <laughs> we can worry about being inattentive. Yeah. And being inattentive and criticizing devotees. First and the last. Yeah. Same thing with zero practice. Yeah. But really. You know, the interesting thing about maintaining attachments, if you study what it means, it, it means to think you identify with the body. And so if you identify with the body, then you want to expand your attachments. But if you're a devotee, you're doing devotional service, you're pretty detached, even if you're living comfortably. So, you know, to think I'm a body after all these years of chanting means I'm still trying to enjoy my body. I'm still working for that. And most of the good devotees don't. When um, Tripurari Maharaj asked Prabhupada, will we, be, will we become self-realized by doing book distribution? Prabhupada said, you already are self-realized. Otherwise, how could you go out on book distribution? <laughs> so the same context, right? You don't identify with the body. If you did, why would you be out on the street trying to stop people who are going to tell you you're stupid and you should get a job. You would be doing something else. So, you know, devotees always say, I, you know, I still think I'm my body. You still think your body, why did you come to Mongol Arctic if you thought you were the body? You didn't, you don't think, you know, that's not what people who think they're the body do. They sleep more. Why don't, why aren't you eating all these things if you think you're the body? So we actually don't. If you're engaged in devotional service, technically, you don't think you're the body. Otherwise, you engage your body and your sense of everything. So that's that's another way of looking at it. So to maintain material attachment is to think my body is for sense gratification rather than Krishna service. So that's good news, right? We're not attached. We're not attached. We're all very detached. And even if my body wants something, but I know it's bad, I don't give into it. So still, that means I'm not thinking I'm the body. Like a lot of times people will offer me something you know, to eat and I say, no, no, I don't want it. I won't, I won't eat it. And they'll look at me and it's something delicious. And they'll, they'll get puzzled. They say, 
don't you like it? And I say, that's exactly why I'm not eating it because I like it and I'll eat 10 of them. So mm -hmm. I'm not going to eat any. And they're like looking at me all the time. Just came out of the mental hospital. But <clears throat> Sometimes we're like that. Right? You want this? No. Why? It's good. I know it's good. That's the problem. I like it. I'm not going to do it because I won't control myself. It's because I'm not identifying with the body. Otherwise, generally, you don't do that. Um, not everybody will do that, but it's for the purpose of sense. I'm not going to eat that. Why? Because it's not good for me, and then I can't enjoy life if I eat this. But we're like, well, I'll eat this. It's not good for my spiritual life. It's different. Correct. What is Krishna? Okay. It's time to say goodbye. Yeah. Goodbye. Uh -huh. Adios. Thank you. Let's go away now. Shiva Prabhupada.